Thank you. We are a very young organization, so please uh, spread the word about Sabina Foundation. Do like us on our Insta page or whatever it's called. Um, Sabina Foundation, and um, we have a Facebook page as well, and we shall soon have a YouTube page up as well. Okay, so without further delay, I will uh, get to the format of the session. It's going to be very casual. We're just going to have a conversation. Um, I ask Samia a few questions and uh, you know, she respond. We do that for about half an hour and then we open it up to you. So whatever questions you guys might have about this topic, anything that may have come up during the session, um, we want to open it up for you to engage with our speaker. So Samia is one of the most uh, sought out after Counselors in Karachi. She's a, she's a counselor, she's a supervisor, she's a teacher. She runs the CPPD counseling school here in Karachi, uh, the Pakistan chapter. She's one of the partners here. Before counseling, uh, uh, Samia was a lawyer, so she moved into the mental health world in about 2012. And um, she's got a master practitioner a diploma in eating disorders from the National Center of Eating Disorders in the UK. And I think you're probably one of the only eating disorder specialists in Pakistan. Um, I don't know of any more. Yes, I mean, I know a lot of therapists work in yeah. disorders, but in terms of a specialized, uh, a specialization, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so I guess, uh, thank you again for taking out the time and being here with us and uh, talking about this very important and very uh, neglected topic. It, it impacts so many of us, but yet we don't know enough about it. So thank you so much for being here. And I'm just going to hand it over to you. Why don't we start with, um, you know, the basics. What are eating disorders? What sort of got you interested in the field? And if you can just clarify whatever myths, misconceptions we may have about eating disorders. Sure, sure. Is the sound okay? Yeah. Okay, so, um, like I said, I was a lawyer by profession, and then I sort of swapped over uh, to counseling. And it was actually um, during my training that, you know, you sort of become more aware of your emotion, your feelings, a lot more self-awareness that comes, and I realized that perhaps there was a, a problem, right? So I had been sort of overweight since I was a kid, from the age of like 10 to about 28. And then, like, you know, so I had a tough time, some job issues happening, dropped a lot of weight, dieting. Okay. Um, and it just got to a point where suddenly it was celebrated, right? Suddenly that, that I was sort of the center of attention at family gatherings, um, at, uh, at, at any parties, eventually you just become a skinny goody girl, right? After being the fat funny one for like 28 years. Um, and then I realized it was through the CPD training and the first easy disorder uh, class that we had, which Incidentally, I now teach, right? Uh, come full circle sometimes. Uh, one of my friends was sitting with me when we were doing this course, uh, the, the class, and she kept nudging me every night, and I'm just sitting there listening to this woman and zoning out, because I was like, no, this is not me, you know? Uh, and she's like, this is you, dude. Like, this is you. I mean, you're the one who will not go out on a Friday if you eat enough biryani and you've not gone to the gym, you know? Um, and that got me thinking. You know, and then um, I found the training. I actually the same training that teacher had done. She recommended it for me uh, after I qualified, and that's where my journey in recovery began. You know, because I went from probably what would one would call impulsive overeating, sort of self-soothing my emotions, uh, to becoming what we now call orthorexic. Right? So it's orthorexia is kind of like the the sister of anorexia. Um, where you're not clinically, you're not over underweight, but your uh, thought patterns, your behavior patterns are very, very similar, and yes, there is a huge restriction in sort of types of food that you're eating. And this, you know, I'm afraid is very, very common in Pakistan. I mean, you will see this everywhere, right? Um, family, closest of friends, and, you know, you ask them to just talk about and I was like, oh God, they have never said no to you, you know? <laughs> But, uh, and also the, the, the cause was amazing, you know. Um, but my fear was, is just this, that people have very strong reactions when we think about food. 
right? Particularly with our own relationship with food. So I'm very mindful that this brings up big feelings. And I just want us to sort of be kind to ourselves today for the next 30 minutes, hour, however long this chat goes on for. Um, and just be curious, you know, rather than sort of the first thing we tend to do quite often when it comes to food is we judge. We judge ourselves instantly, uh, we judge others. So, you know, what I would just request is if people can just be mindful, a bit curious, and just open to, to something new. Right, with some new information. Because clearly there's some kind of curiosity that's brought you on here. Yeah? So, you were talking about what is an eating disorder. I think um, what I normally say to people is to like, really answer that question. Let's look at what is normal eating, right? Because I get asked that question a lot, you know. How much is the appropriate portion? What should I be eating? Is this a good food? Is this a bad food? And so for me, you know, to look at what normal eating is, we sort of look at sort of what effect does food have on us, right? What kind of feelings do we have about food? So if I think about food, if I ask you to think about food now, what feelings come up? Do you feel excited? Do you feel anxious? Do you feel distracted, restless, right? What sort of feelings come up when we think about food? What sort of um, behavior do we have around food? Yeah, so, for instance, is our behavior quite flexible? Yeah, um, you know, do we eat breakfast in the morning? Do we not eat breakfast? Do we skip meals? Right? Do we do the dreaded intermittent fasting? Right? Like, what is it? What is our behavior about food? And then thinking, cognition, right? How do we think about food? Right? Is our behavior more rule bound? Is it more flexible? Or is it more like, you know, so for me it was like, I would only eat one carb meal a week. Right? That was my done thing. Anything more than one car per week, that was it. I've blown it. Right? And that's also very common with people who are eating disorder. I've blown it. Oh well, if I've eaten one car meal, I might as well eat more. Right? If I've eaten one biscuit, now I might as well eat the whole bag. Yeah? So, you know, but to understand normal eating, what we have to understand is that it is not the type of food, it is not the quantity of food. But it is the attitude that we all hold about food. Yeah? And all of us will have a different attitude about food. So what's normal for me might not be normal for you, Papa. You know? So and there will be days where with normal eating, but I say you know, some days you eat more and some days you eat less. Some seasons, if it's winter, you are just being hungry of these days. Yeah? Winters we eat we eat more. There's a whole you know, there's a whole sort of science sort of behind that, right? It's about being flexible. It's having some rules, but not too many rules. Yeah? So I think it's really important to understand that because we hear that a lot. What is the what is the you know the right kind of food? All food is right. There's no such thing as bad food. Yeah. It's more about the attitude we hold towards it. So if you look at what an eating disorder is, then now you know with an eating disorder. You know, what's important to remember is that there, it's on the spectrum, yeah? So you have eating disorders on one end, you have disordered eating on the other end. And it is very much, I mean, I'd say a very uh, textbook definition would be excessive concerns about weight, shape, and size, uh, coupled with sort of a sort of kind of extreme injurious behavior, along with a poor body image, right? our thoughts and our beliefs about ourselves, our body, uh, and sort of over serious and like over importance given to body image. Yeah? So that is what I'd say a textbook definition is. You know, there are various types of eating disorders. I mean, there are four big ones, but most of us, even the most of the clients that I see, don't always fall in very easily into those categories. Because as human beings, it's very hard to put us into physical categories, right? We're more complex than that. So when I'm, you know, looking at what a definition for an eating disorder is, I kind of imagine a tornado. Yeah? Everyone knows what a tornado looks like and what a tornado does, right? It sort of determines its own path and it whips everything up and it destroys everything in its path. Yeah? And that is what an eating disorder is. It will destroy um, your physical health, your emotional well-being, your family life, um, a romantic life if you have one, uh, it will destroy any relationship that you really have, yeah? 
That is what an eating disorder can do if it's left untreated. So, on the other end of the spectrum, we have uh, disordered eating, right? Which is kind of like the milder version. You know what I mean? Like just the, the milder version of what an eating disorder is, depending on the sort of level of the sort of, of the, the frequency of it as so, a behavior. So just going to pause you for a second before you go into the disorder eating. Um, I just want to sort of understand a little bit more about, uh, you know, you said that eating disorder is not uh, necessarily what you're, uh, what you're eating, but it's your attitude around it, right? It's how you're feeling about food, how you're feeling about all of that. And, and then you describe this tornado. And that it, why, so are you right now talking about the major uh, disorders, the major four disorders that you were mentioning, or is there a big spectrum of... I think there's a big spectrum. So there are very few clients of mine. So your big major disorders, you have anorexia. Has everyone, has everyone heard of anorexia? Yeah? Then you have uh, bulimia, right? Uh, you've got binge eating. Then you've got this catch-all category that comes in the diagnostic manual, the DSM-5, which is called feeding and eating disorders not elsewhere specified. <laughs> feeding and eating disorders not elsewhere specified. They call it fennec. Now, I'm never going to go to a client and say, hey, honey, you have fennec. <laughs> right? Like, and most of us tend to fall in the latter. Right? So very, very few, and I won't say not all, but I would say a very small percentage of my clients would cleanly fit the DSM definition of what anorexia is, right? Or what bulimia is. Mm -hmm. So for me, when I'm working with clients, I try and get a sense of, okay, let's try and figure out how do we get here, right? Mm -hmm. Because you're finally sitting here in front of a therapist, you know, you know you've come to food related issues, let's see what got you here, right? And then, where do you want to go from here? So for me, also, uh, Mentioned orthorexia. Oh, what is that? So, orthorexia is not in the DSM-5 yet. There's a lot of controversy about that. So, orthorexia is kind of like um, healthy eating gone wrong, right? So, kind of like what I had. So, I have been overweight most of my life. I went on a diet. Um, and my way of dieting was the one acting through the big trend, right? The new keto. Uh, where you put your body into ketosis, right? So, started doing Atkins, um, and from there just sort of like, okay, I'll just start just removing carbs first, right? Then, I started doing Atkins, because Atkins is you're focusing on fat. It's like, no, no, I'm going to remove the fat now as well, right? So you're removing large food groups to get to a point where you, you suddenly become really restrictive. Like, I could eat the same breakfast every day for three months. It wouldn't bother, because for me, it was just a case just was, Right? Like, uh, so orthorexia can, can sort of go to very extreme levels. Um, and the scary thing is you see it everywhere. Right? Whether it's, it's your keto, your paleo, your intermittent fasting, you know, and I apologize this bringing up stuff for people because, you know, we've all been there. Right? We've all tried one diet or the other. But I wonder how many of you would actually consider a diet if I were to tell you that scientifically proven, dieting has a 97% failure rate. I wonder how many of us would have gone on that first diet. Right, that first diet that we go on, that eventually will just mess up our satiety senses. So we have to notice the children, their food diets vary, right? They, you could give them, they eat the same mac and cheese one day, and the next day, one day they wipe their plate clean, the next day they won't, they, they won't be able to finish it. And, and we'd be like, hey, you know, finish your food, finish your food, right? But what we don't realize is, I'm not going to diet in our body, we have senses in our throat, in our gut, in our stomach, right? And tell our, our mind and our body, hey, we've reached satiation. When you go on a diet, we automatically start to mess with that system, right? That natural system in our body, which will tell us when to stop. And instead, we sort of find cognitive cues. Aapko aadha dose khana hai, ye easy, like, you know, do piece ginger chicken, ya aadha can tuna ka khana hai aapko. And that is what we tell ourselves, that this is all I need. But actually, normally, some days you need more. You know, the days I've worked out, 
I will eat a much bigger breakfast the days I see more clients are hungrier because I mean, why do we eat? What is the purpose? What do you think? Energy. Energy, right? Pleasure. Pleasure, absolutely. Yeah? So food, from a very biological perspective, is our fuel. Yeah? We need a certain amount of carbohydrates, we need a certain amount of protein, we need a certain amount of essential fats, omega-3, omega-6, there are all these uh, minerals that we need as well, right? Now, if we put the right food in our body, our body is thermogenic, means we burn energy. Right? Our body will tend to burn it. But if you are eating a diesel car, then what will happen? What will happen? It will stop. Right? Our bodies are, you know, much more resilient than that. They will go to a certain level. They will probably experience a headache. We might get, we might suffer with insomnia. We might suffer with sleep disorders. We might suffer with insomnia. We might suffer with cold hands, cold feet. Yeah? But it will be like a thakka start of the car. Right? And eventually, like a car that you keep thakka starting, what happens to it? Right? It breaks down, right? Battery dies. Similarly, eventually, even your body starts to present its will. Right? There's only so much abuse our bodies can take. We have very resilient bodies, but if we don't look after them, if we don't put the right fuel in, it's not going to run. And this was also an interesting word you used, disordered eating. Can you expand a little bit on that? So, I think a lot of us, yeah, it's funny that, yeah, I think a lot of us can be disordered eaters, right, and sometimes disordered eating, um, you know, can, can happen with things like, like, we all become a little disordered in our eating during Ramzan, right, but it's an out of an ordinary situation, we are fasting, we just eat at the end, we, we don't know how to eat breakfast anymore, because for so long, we've just not been used to it, and we, our, our bodies take at least a week, or so, other than the body that will happen over the eat, the samanya, the shir, kurma, and all that, but our bodies take a while, right, to adjust. So, disordered eating is a milder eating disorder. It is kind of, again, that thought process that comes into food, right? It is that same misuse of food. So, a lot of diets, all diets fall under disordered eating. Yeah. So things like uh, keto, putting your body into this ketosis, you can't be in it forever. You know, it's like asking your body, it's like asking somebody to cycle backwards. When, when the bike has been made to cycle forward, why are you asking it to cycle backwards? So our bodies are thermogenic. That is just there, that's science, right? And as eating disorder, not we love to make up our own science. Yeah, which I was guilty of myself. You know, carbs will make me fat, and, and exercise will make me thin. But actually, the exercise karne is going to take you, what was it? You would have to run 11 miles to burn the calories in a mass bar. Nobody can do that kind of exercise for one mass bar, right? Like, so it's not excessive exercise that is actually going to uh, keep you at a healthy weight, right? Keep, keep your, your engine running at an optimum level. It is actually putting the right fuel. And, and being able to sort of manage your activity levels. Yeah. So more activity than exercise. I'm not saying exercise is good, it's very important, but move around more, right? So when I teach, I stand and I teach a lot more because actually you're burning calories a lot more like that, right? Um, I, I carry a smaller water bottle. Get up, go fill up your water bottle. More, more diet. Some would you say that then uh, you know people who are like what you're describing seems like you are concerned about the calories and how much you're burning and constantly that's on your mind. So would you say that that is falling under um, you know the what you were saying about the attitude towards food? So is that I think it's more about our attitude towards health versus food. Right? So I would say that. Food is everyone's first drug. Yeah? It's, since we're children, it's the first thing we love to use. Because it's very available, it's free, you know, French cola, and it's right there. Yeah? So, we learn to use food to regulate our emotions from a very young age. Yeah? So, when I say that no Atri Padma, you know, I, I move around more because I know I, I, my job is very sedentary. I sit five hours a day 
in front of people as, as a therapist. So for me, I, I'm very conscious of the fact that I do need to move around more because it's better for my engine, right? To get greased up enough, get, get those muscles being used enough. Not about burning the calories more so, but that it's actually helping my body. So that, that's a very important distinction. Yeah. And it's your relationship with your self, with your body, um, with your health. Yeah, absolutely. And you're more concerned about rather than how many calories you're taking in or what you're eating and what, how that's going to impact yeah. your weight, shape, or size, as you said. Um, can we move on a little bit sure. to the next question? Do you, do you have anything else you want to say about eating disorders or disordered eating or the spectrum? Because I think, I've got, I think the biggest thing to remember is you know you've got a problem when your size becomes a measure of your self-worth. If I am not okay, if I am not this size, if this is not this waist size jeans, this dress size, I should be able to fit into a small, right? When your size becomes a measure of your self-worth, that, that's when you go to start thinking. I know, and it's so true. I think so many people probably can relate to that, that if you're beyond a certain weight, you know, we keep telling ourselves that, you know, man, if they cage you won't be, then I'm push you you know. Um, I'll reach that point, then I'll just maintain it and then I'm push you. Let me get to my wedding weight. Let me just uh, right. get there, you know. And then people do say that they feel happier when they are that weight. And um, how so, it's interesting that, right? Because this is something that we all look at. We all have a magic weight number, right? Anyone know that magic weight number? Right. Definitely. Yeah, what's yours? What's yours? 55. 55. Anyone else? 50, I would say. 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50 to 55. Anything under 55, then it's like, oh. Yeah. Mine used to be 60. Anyone else? 60. 60, yeah? Now, the chances of us meeting this number, what is the decision making process over this number? Does, does anyone, do you have any specific reason why it was? The wedding age. Wedding age. <laughs> yes. How old were you when you got married? 25. 25. <laughs> and your kids? Three. Three, mashallah. Three human beings yes. have come through that body. Yeah. And you wanted to go back to where it was. Yeah, it's very unrealistic. <laughs> it's not about unrealistic, but it's about honoring what our bodies have gone through. Right? That actually this body has produced three human beings. And is it, what is it, what is the standard that we're trying to reach? Is that, is that was our measure of self-worth then? Do you know what I mean? It's about the, the, thinking about that, what does this need to go towards that? You know, and the funny thing is that when, uh, when I was that weight, even then it was always like I need to be less. Yeah. So there's and just this obsession with just being less. Yeah. And this is what most of my clients will say, right? Is that when they look back at pictures, and I look at pictures, because I feel, I found memories that is terrible, right? They bring up the old, skinny, and you look at them, and the first thing I'll, I'll do is I'll zoom into my eyes, right? Like, and that will just give me that answer, that I need and remember, you know? And I tell my clients, well, go look at your eyes, because they will be vacant, they will be empty, they will be exhausted, there will be a, a sense of desolation and isolation in them. I can guarantee you, if there was an issue with food, yeah, that it will be there. And so, actually, we like this idea, and we built this story in our head, this narrative that I was so much happier at that time, and we built this story. I was happier, I was thinner, people liked me more, people complimented me more, boys liked me, you know, all of that, right? Like, but actually, if you had what I call a dishonest relationship with food, so that is what an eating disorder is, you were miserable. You were socially isolated, you were withdrawn, you were full of shame. You know, there's a whole list that I've written down and I'm blanking out slowly on. This, uh, this but brings me to the next question, mm -hmm. which is what is it like to live with an eating disorder? I mean, I'm... Uh, yeah. No, I don't have yeah, some idea of what it might be like, but uh, you know, if you would just expand a little bit more on that. Yeah. Your own exper expertise and the fact that you work with so many clients who specifically come in with this issue, what is it like to live with an eating disorder? In one word, lonely. Yeah. There is a lot of secrecy around eating disorders, and, and where there is secrecy, there is shame. Yeah. That sense of not good enough. You know, the difference in, in, in guilt and shame. There's a lot of guilt too, but I think there's more shame. 
So great is, I did something bad. And shame is, hence I am bad. Shame is about identity. And it becomes more about our behavior. Yeah. And so, for most of people who suffer from eating disorders, disordered eating, it's very much a case of being, the set is not good enough. I didn't exercise enough, you know? I didn't do this enough. I could have eaten less, you know? I could have binged less. There's always a sense of a standard you're not meeting. So there's a not enoughness, usually enough, yeah? And we're preoccupied by food. I mean, I was power through Instagram, through Facebook, look at food menus, uh, cooking shows, anything, right? Because for a restricted eater that I've become, I mean, I was always hungry. Absolutely starving all the time. Yeah? Then it, it was, it, one of the biggest things you notice in, in people with uh, restricted eating is that we would look at a menu before we go to the restaurant. Because we want to make sure there's something safe for us to eat. You know, we want to make sure that there's something grilled or something, whatever is our safe food. You know, for me, eggs are my safe food. I'm just eating a day, I eat two chawal, I eat two chawal, I eat two chawal, I eat two chawal, I eat two Because in my head, the science I made up was eggs are safe, eggs are protein. Yeah, biryani is bad because it's chawal. But actually, and manda paratha is actually a very nutritionally dense meal, which is what we sort of move towards getting our clients to go towards. You know, it's got, a, it's got if you know, your bar has been made with some ghee, you've got some good fat, you've got some carbohydrates, you've got proteins. I was going to say, you need two eggs, you need one, you need a good solid 20 grams of protein um, in our meals, which we don't usually have. Does anyone know what 20 grams of protein looks like? Sounds ish. Would you like to tell the audience? <coughs> if it's it's more really a because it has, guess what, carbohydrates mm. and fats. Absolutely. Yeah, the grains of protein and chicken So we tend to eat protein, right? I'm like, we take a little bit of protein, we take a little bit of chicken, we take a little bit of chicken, we take a little bit So it's about learning to re-eat. And that's what it's been really difficult to, you know, having done this training in the UK and coming here. And people like Nazish, who's a nutritional therapist, probably our only nutritional therapist in Pakistan that I'm aware of, the one I go to at least, you know, <laughs> and who I set my clients to, who will understand what nutritional density is, you know, what I mean, and, and how do we get it in our daily food. We will not be spending our day eating smashed avocados and smoked salmon, you know what I mean? That's not our diet. Like, how do we find nutritional density in our daily khana? You know, and that's the sort of work that I'm leaning more towards doing with people is how do we cook food, our daily, you know, kima, sabzi, dal, chawal, roti, you know, what can we do to increase the nutritional density in our food? I've totally lost where the track was, so let me out, but that's where we were going. Okay. Moved on. But it was all very useful information that you shared. But I think my question was, what is it like to live with an eating yes. disorder? And your main point was that it's very important to this about guilt, there's shame um, attached to it. There's probably a lot of the obsession with what you're eating next. Like you said, you go and you check out the menu before you go to a restaurant. That seems like that's a... Yeah, but, um, there's anxiety. You know, there's anxiety. You know, and then there are a lot of like physical symptoms, right? So, I've got them written down because there are a fair few. You have a lack of energy. You will have trouble sleeping, insomnia. You will have dizziness, headaches, uh, quite common. Uh, you know, there will be a hypersensitivity to light and sound. You know, and I've noticed this in, in, in people close to me as well. They say, oh, so it's also good. I'm like, well, I'm not saying a word, you know? Like, I'm just sitting here talking at my normal volume, but there is this hypersensitivity that we get to light and sound. Uh, old hands, old feet, hair loss happens very often with malnourishment. And on an emotional level, there's even more. There's, your mood fluctuates, you have really strong negative emotions. <laughs> so what's the feeling that we have? You know what I mean? They're really intense. Um, you don't feel very enthusiastic, you have the less motivation. Um, your concentration levels, it's really difficult to concentrate. Most of my younger clients who are sort of O level, A levels, they constantly complain that I can't focus, I must I must be, I must go see a psychiatrist for ADHD because I can't focus. And I remember the last time you ate. 
oh, I don't eat breakfast because, you know, it's not necessary. I have intermittent fasting. I'll be like, you're 15. You know, you need, you need to put nutrition in your body, right? Um, and a lot of interesting is that our problem-solving ability becomes less. And a lot of the work I do with my clients is helping them get back into problem-solving because they just can't, very basic, sort of executive functioning job to a game or chali jati hai. Because our brain is very much attached to our body and our body needs fuel. And the brain does too. That's how it works. You know, these kids who exams are very nashta ni You know, you would not get into a car with half a tank of gas and try and drive your head up out of it, right? But you would send your kid with no nashta, so you don't have to break the tooth either, right? But you won't, we won't push and think about how important that first meat is, right? So Samia, can you tell us a little bit about who is at risk? Like how does it go also from, uh, you know, yeah. disordered eating to like a full-blown eating disorder? Um, is there anything in the upbringing, anything in the environment that puts a lot of people or groups at risk? Or, uh, yeah. I mean, is, um, is there even a link actually between disordered eating and eating disorder? I mean, they're absolutely linked. Disordered eating can move towards eating disorder. So sometimes my clients will come to me when they are at a level of disordered eating. But sometimes in this world, you get worse before you get better. And that's something that I have to remind my clients. Because they say, but I'm not getting better. I'm not getting better. And I, I used to throw up, you know, I used to binge and purge and sort of vomit three times a day, I'm not doing it six times a day. But sometimes, you've got to hit that rock bottom. You've got to hit that point of, okay, that's it. It doesn't get worse than this, I have to try something, right? Usually, with disordered eaters, um, I would say the age group at risk the most is about age 12 to 24, 25, yeah. Uh, puberty is a big consideration to take into place, yeah. Because dieting is a living metaphor of taking control, yeah. And in puberty, uh, boys and girls sort of, they experience puberty very differently. You know, for a boy, it's a, it's a gain of power and control. They be back on the back, oh, bad, 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 you know, your voice is breaking, you're getting muchas, and you know what I mean, all the fuzz. And it's kind of celebrated, right? But for, for the girls, it's seen as a loss of power and control. You know, in our country, you don't have to worry about it, you don't have to worry about it, you don't have to cover up, right? These things can start to trigger in, in, in a person. So I'd say that um, your risk category is this age group. And what puts you at risk, you know, which is 100%, what they say is what we call a precipitating factor in my work. What precipitates an eating disorder? What comes before an eating disorder or disordered eating is a diet. Right? That's what it is. A diet is what will start it off. When you start using cognitive cues for what is normal in terms of food. Yeah? Rather than trusting your body. So, it's a tough one. And I appreciate it's a scary one. And there are studies. Um, in fact, I did, I, this talk that I did last year for KWF, this mm -hmm. Karachi Wellness Festival, was on why diets don't work, right? And here we will see tons of studies on, on paleo and keto, and I've actually been collecting information for this, um, for some more work I want to do in sort of myth busting around these diets. That first um, study on intermittent fasting uh, was done on 20 men, <laughs> but has been seen as a gold standard, right? the gold standard for everybody. It doesn't take into account people with hormonal issues, right? Why in four Pakistani women have polycystic ovaries? It does not take into account um, people with other issues, whether it's diabetes, all sorts, right? It was done on 20 men. Whereas one of the oldest studies, right, and this goes back to like post Second World War, uh, and please Google this, because it's out there, just not advertised, because it's not going to sell, but it's actually pretty simple. And it's a study called Ansel Keys, A-N-C-E-L-K-E-Y-S, and it's, I think, 1957, yeah? This study was done post the World War when sort of famine was happening quite a lot in, 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 around the world. And they picked, 
Palestinians with about 85, 90 men, and they followed them over the years, right? You know, this is a proper study, a scientific study where it was peer reviewed. These people were followed all over the world, right? And to this day, the people who lived, they have still have given accounts of how badly they were impacted by this. And it was a starvation study, right? And what this study categorically proved, I don't want to go into details about it because of 45 minute talk that we did, you know, um, is that dieting has a 97% failure rate. Only 1 to 3% of people past 18 months will be able to maintain their weight. It will absolutely cause rebound binge eating, right? And chances are you will put out the weight, not just the weight that you lost on the diet, but it is more. Yeah? And there will be this constant cycle of you know, sort of wanting to restrict, trying to diet again, rebound binge eating, because when there's a diet, there will be rebound binge eating. This is what it categorically proved. This study doesn't seem to come out on our social media, right? And so, you know, a lot of people in the eating disorder world are really sort of working on getting these studies. These studies have been replicated over and over. That people have had to disprove it, but you can't disprove it because you can, it's hard to disprove science, right? And so, you know, so for me, the difficulty that comes about my husband somebody was, but I never eat breakfast. But I just can't eat breakfast. And it's, you have to learn to break that mindset. You know, I mean, I want you to think about the kind of strong feelings that may have come up in all of you right now. We are all disordered and I on some ways. It's, it's, it's called being human, right? But it's the level of frequency of it, the severity of it, that we have to think about. So would you say then that a cause for uh, this illness would be dieting? So I would say that dieting is the necessary factor that needs to be there for, because it's a little bit more complicated, for the, the start of an eating disorder. It's the, the, it, it's, it's the thing you liked, right? Like, that's the image I'm getting in my head, like the matches that you like. You need that to happen for the fire to come, right? And that's what a diet is. It's a precipitating factor. It precipitates the eating disorder. That is what there exactly just before the eating disorder starts. After that, what it means is, it's, what I often tell my people, my clients, particularly the parents who come to me, right? Because they're really distorted when they're young people are not eating, or over eating, or there's bulimia, whatever's happening, it's very distressing for parents as well. And the biggest thing they do is they want to blame themselves. And the first thing I say, look, there's no cause to eating disorder. We cannot scientifically prove the way that studies scientifically prove dieting causes rebound binge eating. There is no study in the world that will prove that trauma causes eating disorders. Or, you know, your family system causes eating disorders. No. <coughs> There are a number of interacting sort of processes that take place that lead to this outcome. I would say that dieting has to be in the backdrop against a kind of personal history, against a kind of um, personality for an eating disorder or disordered eating to emerge. And then, uh, would you say that some triggering event can, uh, you know, some event like circumstances yeah. can also trigger it into a full blown? Um, yeah. Disorder, right? Yeah. Because Absolutely. like you said, it's all about control. So when you lose control in some other aspect of your life, you try to regain it in something else. Absolutely. So for young people, I will say sometimes it's when there's a divorce that's happening in the family. Yeah. Some big, unpleasant, difficult, traumatic event has taken place in the family. Um, you know, sometimes it can be bullying in school. You know, I've had 13 year, 30 year old girls come to me and say, you know, I'm not allowed in that group of friends because I don't have a Thai gap. They're the Thai gap gang. You know? Um, so there's a lot of pressure, right? So the first factor that really comes into play is culture. You know? Like, our, what does our culture? There's this huge social pressure to be thin. Right? There's this huge social pressure that thin equals okay. Right? If you're thin, you're okay, you're in control of your life, because that's what acting is, it's taking control. And so if you're nothing, if you're overweight, what are you then? So I want to take up more of your time, because I know uh, the audience probably also has questions, but um, as a last question I want to just ask you is, um, as parents, as caregivers, as school teachers, and you know, people who are concerned about the next generation, you know, what, what is it that we can do to prevent this from 
becoming um, a major issue in the next generation? I mean, there are many things that we can do, but the biggest thing, first of all, that we can do is model it to our parents. If you're not eating breakfast, you need to start eating breakfast. If there's one takeaway you take today, eat breakfast. It's a good thing, really. You know? Um, Sometimes it's, it's little things. You know, I can talk about you know managing your blood sugar, right? Now, that's something that would really help. Uh, focusing on the nutritional density of food, and those are like I can go into detail about. But here's some very basic things that you can do: take away screens from your meal times and eat on a table. Yeah, and most of my parents would say, "Well, what did I do that?" <laughs> like, but you're doing something now. Yeah, you're eating. Like that is the action that you are taking. You will eat thirty percent less. If you, if you eat without a screen in front of you, yeah? Slowing down our eating. So something as simple as and before that we even chew and swallow the next nawala that we made. Same with a fork, just notice when you're eating next time. You'll be putting one mouthful in your mouth and the fork is already taken the next mouthful, right? Just something that we had to learn to do in our training was to put your fork down. If you're eating with your hand, the heart eating and finish chewing and then take it. When you slow down eating, it takes our brain and our body 20 minutes to sync up and to understand that actually we are no longer hungry. Right? Um, and so if we can slow down that eating, that would be a good one. Right? It's something as simple as um, eating on a smaller dinner plate. Right? Our dinner plates, if anyone has a dinner set from 30 years ago, take a big measuring set, because I know I've got one at home. The dinner plate is about seven uh, inches across, right? Your average dinner plate now is almost double. Yeah? So think of what that's doing with your brain, your eye coordination on the, on the plate or the food, right? These are just small things. If you can, you know, I come up with a whole ten lot of things that you can do, and really my sort of thing to everybody is start with one thing and do it for a month. If you can just Eat without a screen for a month, right? Just try that, right? Next month, sit at a table, right? Using your table and eating without a screen. Next month, change your dinner plates, right? Just try it. Do one small thing a month and you will be surprised. It takes 21 days to make a habit. Um, and how about, um, you know, also in terms of their, um, you know, we, when we grew up, there was always an obsession about you know, weight and uh, kiss and I say, you know, every, every time anyone would enter the room, have I lost weight, have I put on weight, yeah. you look so thin, you look so fat, you look so, you know. Um, do you have anything to say about that in terms of our younger generation, you know, not commenting about the shape and the size and yeah. looks? I think it's really we don't compliment. No, we don't. Right. right. Other than looks? We can only compliment on people's physical appearances and that becomes really difficult. You know, we don't, even when we say things like, you know, somebody put on my, uh, as a culture that has to change, somebody put on my birthday post, happy birthday beautiful, what does that have to do with me? Do you know what I mean? Am I just that? Like, we are more than just our bodies, you know? There's so much more to us, our bodies are very tall from our it's, it's our only home, really, on this planet, right? This is the home that houses us, and so, Learning to realize that, yes, the body is one thing, but it's about changing our attitude. And I think that will take, I don't know what, like how to get people to change how they, oh, how good you look, how healthy you look, right? Like, especially with my clients, we never talk about it. Like, it just doesn't come in. Not that it's not important, you know, but it's about taking pride in you, right? And your appearance is just one of them. So it's trying to get that mindset to change. Thank you so much, uh, Samyam. I'm going to ask the audience if anyone else has any questions for um, Samyam. Yeah. Hi. Hi, thank you so much. This is really, really important and eye-opening. Um, so the question I have is, how does one approach somebody in case you feel that they might be struggling with an eating disorder? Mm -hmm. So what's the PC way of kind of trying to approach them without it being too confrontational, because I have noticed at times, for example, you know, going out for dinner, certain people after courses, leaving for a little bit, 
you know, to the rest, to the toilet, and then that becomes a habit that you see and you notice over time. Yeah. So how does one broach something which is so shrouded in secrecy yeah. um, and shame and guilt? I think you need to look for signs for it. Mm -hmm. So for instance, if it's somebody who's, who's purging a lot, mm -hmm. you'll notice that their glands are a bit swollen. You'll notice their knuckles, they're really serious at purging. They're, they're going to have slightly reddish knuckles. Um, and in terms of bringing it up to them, I would say gently, you know, because again, extreme emotional reactions. And there's, there's a physiological reason for that, right? Because there is such nutritional chaos happening inside that it's, that people can have very extreme, extreme emotions. Um, I would always bring it, I start with me, right? So I bring it up to me, even with all of you, I talked about me first. And that kind of neutralizes it, right? Like it kind of deflates the situation, hey, I'm, I'm there too, you know. So maybe even talk about, you know, we won't have the odd struggle with food. Maybe even talk about your own. And say, hey man, this is how I've been feeling, you know. Um, feels weird, it feels really difficult. Sometimes I get quite anxious. And see how the reaction is. Gauge the, the reaction, you know. And then if they are willing to talk about it, say, you know, how can I help? Because a lot of times, you, it takes a long time for you to be ready to want help. See Thank you. So I have seen very young mothers you know, who have first born or stupid face uh, toddlers. They put up an iPad or phone or something and then they make the kids eat. Saying kids that are so I think if it continues, say around the age of 12 ish, or the tween age, you know, that 10, 11 year old as well, what it can do is, is it will create sort of a dysregulation in the mind and the body where they will not learn to understand their satiety senses, right? And, and so a habit can be unlearned. And, you know, I understand why moms put their kids in front of the iPad. You know, it's that 15 minutes of reprieve that they're getting with, okay, my kid is eating. There's a lot of pressure on moms. Am I doing this right as well, you know? So, but go other kids do I hear them? And so, I think if, if that kid, that infant has made that habit, it's not necessarily that they will develop a sort of eating or eating disorder, but it will certainly mess with their regulation of their mind and their stomach, absolutely, in terms of satiation. Also in terms of digestion. And digestion. Yes, and I mean, since you're a, a, a trainer, you said, right? But this trainer, what I would really recommend, have them do a food diary. Just have them do a food diary and see what comes up, right? Because sometimes the bloatedness, etc., can be from malnourishment, it can be from gut issues, it can be a lot of things. Um, but even with my clients who have just come to me with anxiety sometimes, I'll make them do a food diary. And suddenly you realize what's happening because Malnourishment will create, physiologically create anxiety in you, right? So it's amazing for, for people who are in this profession, nutritionists, uh, fitness people, start to get your clients to a food diary. And, and then you will be the best gauge as to what uh, the situation is. Because every individual's issues are so unique, right? Some people will have ideas from physiological issues. Some people will have ideas from uh, more psychological issues. So, a uh, uh, food diary is where, uh, for, like, so like one page is for like one day, and you would record the time that you ate your, your meal, whichever is your first meal of the day, what you were eating. So, I want to know, okay, I have the egg, I have the egg toast, I have the tamara toast, I was like a, you know, like I always say, is it the glucose buddy one or is it the smaller size of bread, right? Like, 
uh, how much water you consume, what will your mood, where will you be eating it, like the location, what were you feeling around the time you were eating it, right? Was anything else happening? Did anything else happen before or after your meal that you want to put down? Yeah. So I have a pretty, like, there's a pretty standardized format. Uh, I don't recommend these apps. This is my fitness pal type because again they sort of go towards calorie counting and that is very much trying to drive a car on half a ton of gas, right? But I would recommend, you know, if you want a food diary, I can send you a food diary. But a very simple one you will find at, on places like uh, the National Center for Eating Disorders, right? Uh, the American Psychological Association, they will have a food diary. So go to these specific sites and pull out uh, a food diary that's used as psycho for psycho uh, psychological perspective. And that will really help you. It will also give you information on uh, any kind of purging that's happening. Whether it's vomiting, some people will try to purge through vomiting, some people will try to purge through use, overuse of laxatives. Yeah. So that's how I just feel with the food diary, it's one thing easy to get out here. When you're looking at someone who's overweight, uh, how do you distinguish that that person is suffering from a eating disorder versus a, a physiological problem like an insulin resistance problem? Because uh, they may be eating a bar of chocolate and they are insulin resistant. Yeah. But someone with a better metabolic system and not suffering from insulin resistance will not put on that way. So how do you distinguish that that person is suffering from an eating disorder or an insulin resistant problem? So, well, I think one, one would be that, you know, you look at the food diet, but what I would also want to do is, that's a very good question, because not everybody who's overweight has an eating disorder, yes. right? There will be some people which will fall into the sort of the obesity side of things, and that's a whole other subject, which can vary from sort of genes to medical issues, like you're saying, mm -hmm. right? And so, I would want, I always work as a team. So for me, I work with a doctor, the doctor that I use, the physician I use very often, is uh, a lady called Dr. Punaf Khan at Awa Khan. She is the only physician that I know, family physician, who is trained in eating disorders. So I would get a full blood workup done, right? You would look at your lipid levels, your insulin, all of that. The side of your kept there in first. And then you look at it. Sometimes there's a bit of both, right? Sometimes there's a bit of binge eating happening because of you're using food to numb out those upset feelings because we have no control over our body, right? So it can be a bit of both. So I would always work with a doctor, I would always work with a nutritionist, and in some cases, whether it's obesity or eating disorder, I'd have to, you'd also have to use a dietitian. Yes, two questions. Yes. Okay, so uh, I um, when my friends are telling me about their own problems, I noticed that more boys approach me with this problem than girls do. And I was talking to a friend today and he was telling me how he's really happy that one of his friends bullied him about his body weight because it pushed him to start going to the gym. And I tried explaining this night, he's like, you know, you don't have to do that, like, you know, but he just kept saying it's a good thing, it's a good thing, like, you know, and I just don't know how to, like, I don't want to push anyone, but I don't know how to show them that you don't need to do that, because I feel like guys in our generation believe it's a really good thing to have an eating disorder and to go and to ex exercise excessively, and girls are kind of still more open to, like, I think they're more open-minded with this, but then guys just think it's, like, you know, um, it's a good thing, that they're progressive, so I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting that eating disorders, generally, it's, it affects the sufferers that usually 90% are women and 10% men, but in the, I would say since COVID, I have seen a huge increase in, I'd say about 30, 40% in, in, in boys. Yeah. And it's this young sort of 16 age group where they're sort of going through puberty and they try to figure out, they want to start bulking up, they take protein shakes, they're overworking themselves at the gym. And, and I think COVID has a lot to do with it, you know. Um, so in terms of your friend, again, I think talking to him about what what happened when this friend bullied him, what was that like? So apparently it was a mutual thing for both of their betterment. One was like reducing, one was like reducing overweight and it pushed both of us away the gym. And I was like, that is not good for either of you. And so chances that they probably both became quite like orthorexic, like quite obsessed. Yeah. So he was repeating the same thing over and over, right? Yeah, and this yeah. friend of mine, so we all are getting like dry coffee from the canteen and he only has black coffee now. 
this is like say, okay, it's not like, you know, there's no need to be in such a time, and there's no need to do that. Then. So I'm not really sure how to approach it, because it's also very, like, um, not, he's not willing to change his mind, because he, he thinks he's right, he doesn't really think of it as a big deal, he's just like, it's the way life is, and I'm just saying he does not think like that. I don't know. Well, in approximately, when did it start? Um, I'm not sure. Two months, three months? I'm not sure. I think, so he, Tony, he's been bullied about this since middle school. Um, but recently it's changed and life is better and the world was white, right? But then like, I'm just like, I don't know. And it's difficult when you see a loved one suffer, right? When you see yeah. your friend, your buddy going through this. Yeah. You know, I think whether he wants to or not, within 18 months, yeah. it will not be sustainable. Yeah. And it will drop things will change. Sometimes we have to let that person go through it. Be there for them as much as we can, but let them get drop out. Because we all have to do it ourselves. Because at the end of the day, no one is going to be around you. Right? Like, so a lot of people relapsed in COVID. Isolation. They're 14 days of isolation. Glorious. No one around. No one know what you're eating. Why are you eating? Right? So a lot of restrictive eaters, myself included, for a couple of days, I'm like, okay, let's go back to Yafi and Kira, man, this works. You know, and then sort of that part of you has to wake up and go, no, there was nobody watching me. I was on my own for 14 days, right? But that there's that part of you that has to get up and say, bus, no more. But 18 months, I can guarantee it. There's no question from there. Yes. that um, the importance that food is given is one very important part of our lives, but there's so much more to our lives in your life. All our socialization is around food, right? Breakfast, brunch, lunch, high tea, dinner, right? So our socialization is around food. Um, whether it it, it can lead to an eating disorder. I don't think it could lead to one. But again, it's the attitude we hold about that. Are we going to be anxious in those occasions? Right? Are we going to be comfortable? So, like, usually December, January is the toughest time for people with eating disorders, right? All over the world, right? And you will see this on sort of good websites, good sort of uh, Facebook pages and Instagram where, you know, they'll be saying, hey, holiday times are hard. You know, yes, you will be eating more than normal, you will be eating out of routine, it's okay, you might feel more bloated. There's a lot of panic around that time. So, I uh, think for me, it's around the holiday season. For us, it's Eats, right? Eat can I, long holidays, yeah, things like that. That is when I feel that you are more at risk, if you're already susceptible. And there are a lot of things that would make you susceptible, whether it's your culture, family. We didn't really touch on that, but family plays a huge role. What are the messaging we've received about food growing up? Uh, did we see our parents' diet? Right? Did our parents have good body image or poor body image? Yeah, that plays a huge role. Yeah. I just wanted to ask, how do you, uh, as a mother, I just wanted to ask, how do you encourage a child to uh, Indulge in more activity, as you said, you know, yeah. pick out, fill your water bottle or go walk or run without body shaming and making him realize that there's something wrong with him or her and not making him feel uh, bad about himself because if as a parent I'm supposed to do it, I spend all my life being body shamed and I wrote about it and I got over it. Uh, you know, uh, women and their body, the most toxic of relationship. Now, in this paradigm, if you have a male child, and that male child refuses to get up from the couch, how do you draw that thin line where you want to be a helpful mom, but you don't want to be body shaming and telling them you're fat? Yeah, I think... And fat is not a bad word, and I don't... No, know absolutely. Bad word. I think, you know, I think first modeling it for your child, yourself, so you moving around more. Letting them see. Children will always do what they see. 
Teenagers? No. no. <laughs> even teenagers. Even teenagers. Children will do what they see, not what you tell them. Right? So the more you are moving around, the more more he will. I also feel when they're younger, trying to get them involved in, in more of a game. You know, create games around the house. Oh, they have chores. a PlayStation. That is gaming enough. <laughs> but creating a list of chores at home. Like making your bed. Oh. You know, you're burning energy, but they're burning your bed. You know that. How easy would that be? Every day in the morning, we could burn a little bit of calories just making our bed. It's free. True. Doesn't even have an expensive gym membership for that, right? Like, it's free. Yeah, so it's little things. It's also giving them a little bit of education on it. Right? I think that, that really helps. And yes, you don't want to fat shame someone, absolutely. They have to find their own way with their body, right? They've got to make their own relationship with their body. But it's instilling these healthy habits. And the one thing that they will do is they will watch you. And it doesn't matter if they're like a cool teenager and now you're like an uncool parent, they're still watching you. And God knows what they are watching. I'm in my tracks all day trying to be running around and God knows. And I think what uh, some of you earlier also mentioned that it's not about the food and it's not about the weight, it's about the health. Exactly. So exactly. Is that that was my question initially. Yeah, exactly. That you don't want to tell them that you're fat, you want to sort of induce in them a healthy habit of, yeah. you know, maybe going for a walk for 45 minutes or biking. Most teenagers don't go for a walk. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it is not. Or, or even gymming or playing a sport. I mean, that's a healthy habit. Uh, how do you... But the minute you say that, the minute they think, and they're very sort of aggressive about it, are you fat shaming? Is there something wrong with me? That was my, actually, the initial question. That How do you draw that line? It's a tough one. It's a tough one. You could it's get a pet, uh, like I a dog, a dog walking or something, it's something it's which kind of sorry. It feels like a dog. It's attractive. It's very demotivating. Yeah. You need to probably see if um, the child is being body shamed in school because that's very demotivating. Exactly. You know, in this case, it actually motivated somebody to the other extreme. On the opposite end of the spectrum is the child just saying, oh, what's the point? I'm fat. Everybody makes fun of me. Anyway, might as well enjoy life. And it has nothing to do with gender because I know if a girl yes. is body shamed, She's going to look in the mirror and loathe, self-loathe, think, oh my god. But somehow I see boys looking in the mirror and they think they are hunks, you know, somehow it's fine. No, that's my question. Is that, does it have to do with the gender that you are? That somehow it has to do with the parenting. <laughs> it has to do with the parenting. can do no wrong in this country. Yeah. Yeah. She wants to add something yeah. to this. For this country, because yeah. I have the same problem with yeah. my children. But I started doing activities with them, which changed their lifestyle. So my, um, I'm a very sporty mom, so that really helped. I was able to walk, so my daughter started walking with me. I'm outside cycling, my son started cycling. Uh, now, uh, change of the activity I do, I started gymming, I can drag my son, and he also gyms the same thing I do. And it, again, as you said, as a parent, yourself. Yeah. So that made a difference in my life. It made a difference in their lives. <coughs> Absolutely. You have to model that your yeah. truth. And really work. Also, when they were little, so activities that so I, when they were even growing up, there was um, a money thing involved. So if they were doing laundry, I used to pay them. If they were doing the water bottle, yes. I used to pay them. And that really worked. So now That's a great one, one, huh? Well, now they're oh. older. <laughs> <laughs> And I pay for water bottle, that's like tough one I'm a parent. So that's that started with the pocket money concept. So I used to pay them for even doing their homework, doing the water bottle, doing the laundry. Yeah, that sounds fantastic. It became a habit. Yeah. It became a habit. Yeah. It became a habit. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
right? And if they are saying that, are you fat shaming me? That means, and you're not fat shaming, shaming them. You're not saying that you're fat, that's why I want you to go and exercise. You're saying that, look, I'm concerned about your health. Um, you're not moving, you know, you're always on the couch, you're always watching TV, there, you know, you need to move to, for whatever reasons, right? Um, for your mental health, for just getting fresh air. And if they're saying that you're body shaming them, then maybe something else is going on. Maybe they have been fat shamed yes. somewhere else. So then it could be like another influence then, like it could maybe be in school or some other yeah. place that made them think of that. Absolutely. Yeah. You can always introduce the concept of girlfriends. <laughs> so I, I'm a little like conflicted uh, with you know the conversations we're having because at one level we are trying to encourage people to eat uh, healthier. We're trying to encourage them to gym, um, to activities, but at the same time we don't want them to be too concerned about their looks and about their body and about their weight. I mean, it's it's a fine balance. How do you, especially as a parent, I mean, how do you maneuver this? I think mean, it's the hardest unpaid job in the world, right? Parenting. And it's a balance. And it will change on a day-to-day -day basis, right? You will trust your instinct as a parent. And you will trust that instinct when you are living your truth. Right? So when a lot of times the parents' lifestyles change, the kids' lifestyles do change because that's just their life now. Right? So while you still got them under their roof, you still got a shot. Once they're gone, then that's the tough part. Right? And so it's not about, okay, don't bother about it. It's not a balance. Right? It can be fine that balance. And that balance is going to be different for different people at different stages in their lives. Right? After years of being in recovery, I am suddenly now having to look at watching a little bit of what I'm eating because I quit smoking eight months ago and I have put on weight for the first time and you know obviously the eating disorder mindset kicks in and you start to freak out and then you just sort of go back to thinking about it and going actually it's okay so on one hand you know my therapist said to me she said ironically you're the healthiest you've ever been you know but on the other hand there's that freak out in me so it's hard to find that balance that for me it was very much about nutritional density intuitive eating, you know, my body will guide me as to how much I want. I don't need to be that size 8 or that 60 kilos, you know, that doesn't define me. But right now, there is a concern because it's health. You know what I mean? So it will shift for people. It will never be a constant. Yeah. So that balance will keep shifting for people as, as life goes on. There's no perfection with food. There's no perfect way to be. I think we'll take one more question and I think maybe we should close out to that. Yes, go on. Can I you? Okay. So a common um, sort of side effect of the eating disorder is of insomnia. Right? So that you will have difficulty sleeping. That is definitely there.
Yes. And then you have the energy yes. to stay awake. So and that's quite a dangerous level to climb, right? Oh. Because there's not enough energy in your body to wake yourself up. So even when we're sleeping, we need those calories to yeah. keep our heart pumping, our pancreas working. Maybe 400, 500 calories yeah. a day. Yeah. So she was really under bare minimum. We need, they say, up to about 600 calories to stay alive at night. But, but how do you convince somebody who is so concerned about their, their food and how do you convince them? You know, if they are suffering from an eating disorder, like what, what can we do to help and support and what, what next steps do they need to take? I think, you know, educating yourself first as a family member on it, you know, being able to drop that into conversation, you know, um, and then speaking to a professional about it first, you know, what can you do? Because sometimes as family members, we're enabling it and we don't know it. Modeling it. Yeah, right? and we're modeling it. Yeah. Finding what you want to live for. For example, this 14 year old, she wanted to ace her, she's 15, she wanted to ace her whole levels. So that mattered. And that's why she wanted to get better. So it depends on what matters to you, to me, to the person who's suffering. What really matters to them, just reminding them that you're going to have what matters if they don't do something else. Absolutely. And you know, at worst case scenario, they have been time where you had to hospitalize the clients mm -hmm. for refeeding because. It was, they would die, right? So it would become a threat to life. And so that's when all stops are put out. And unfortunately, the only place here that I would recommend for that is Aha Khan. And even Aha Khan would say, we don't have any disorder of weight. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you want to hope that there's a kick and there's a minor that we can put a beat for. It. Because if you're not, you know, you don't want to go to the general ward. You know, it'd be quite disturbing. The psych ward would be even more disturbing. For the psych ward, there's one room at Aha There's one room. And so it's difficult, right? And yet, this is a mental illness which has the highest mobility rate, you know. And the long-term damage it does to your body. Yeah. Even a short, like even if it's a short-term eating disorder, it has long -term such long-term long -term effects. effects. So perhaps really educating the uh, parents and young people about, yeah. about it. Okay, so... Thank you. Unless there's any burning question, um, I will close. Thank you so much, uh, Samia. Thank you. And we have a small little gift for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for doing what you're doing.